Welcome to our Participatory Medicine Learning Exchange. I'm Sarah Krug, the Acting Executive Director of Society for Participatory Medicine, uh, also the CEO of Cancer 101 and founder of the Health Collaboratory. Today's topic is Why We Revolt, where we have amazing speakers who will talk about the revolution they are proposing to change healthcare. Now, before we begin, I'd like to give a brief history of the Society for Participatory Medicine's Learning Exchange series. SPM's mission is to catalyze collaborative partnerships across the continuum of care to optimize health and healthcare. The Learning Exchange series was created to capture how we are collectively moving the participatory medicine needle, whether it's through our day-to-day -day personal experiences with healthcare or our work in this area. Understanding the work we're conducting in our individual silos can help us learn from one another, build upon ideas, forge collaborations, and ultimately provide a forum for exchange. Thank you to our sponsors, Accenture and Vocera. This series would not have happened uh, without their support. Now, all of the Learning Exchange webinars are recorded, and you'll be able to view the archive of today's presentation, as well as previous webinars, on our website, participatorymedicine.org. The hashtag for the Learning Exchange series is SPM Learning. Feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box on your panel throughout the presentations and we'll try to get through as many as possible during the Q&A at the end. It's an honor to introduce our moderators today, Dr. Sue Woods and Jan Oldenburg. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I am honored to introduce our speakers. Um, we are uh, having Dr. Victor Montori, who is a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic. He's a practicing endocrinologist, researcher, and author, and a recognized expert in evidence-based medicine and shared decision-making. He developed the concept of minimal, minimally disruptive medicine and works to advance person-centered care for all patients, especially those with diabetes and other chronic conditions. He is the author of Why We Revolt, A Patient Revolution for Careful and Kind Care. Maggie Breslin, our other speaker, is the director of The Patient Revolution, which is an action and advocacy movement for careful and kind patient care. It is arming patients and the public with the tools, resources, and support they need to tell their stories and wrestle with the uncertainty in the clinical and public spheres. She spent over a decade as a designer and researcher in the healthcare space, including seven years at the Mayo Clinic Center for Innovation. She holds a Master's of Design from Carnegie Mellon University. I am pleased to turn it over to them with no further ado. And I'd like to add that um, uh, my uh, note to everyone, uh, in addition to Sarah's, that you should uh, add your questions or comments in the Q&A panel, and we'll uh, try to keep an eye on it throughout, as well as get to them at the end. Thank you so much, Maggie and Victor. It's all yours. Great. Thank you so much, Jan and Sue and Sarah. We really appreciate you all um, sort of letting us be here today. Um, Victor, are you able to? Um, yes. Turn in? Perfect. OK. Um, we are coming to you live from the uh, tundra of Minnesota uh, today, where <laughs> it's extraordinarily um, cold, uh, and uh, to sort of talk about what we're doing with the patient revolution and, and, and why we revolt. Um, and so the place where we want to begin is a little bit about what the patient revolution is. Um, it's a nonprofit organization, and our focus is on developing tools and programs and resources that can help patients and caregivers and communities and clinicians work together towards healthcare that is careful and kind. Um, and I'll let Victor talk a little bit about um, careful and kind care and, and where kind of our, our mission and focus has come from. Thank you, Maggie. Um, the central tenet of our work is that the healthcare system as is um, has uh, corrupted its mission that it's, uh, it's no longer fundamentally about caring. And as a result, um, we need to uh, turn it around and turn it to away from this industrial healthcare that we get when we approach it, and instead turn it towards careful and kind care. Uh, in industrial healthcare, we're used to be seen without 
uh, appreciating our circumstances and our situation, uh, oftentimes as a test result or as a statistic, or simply just too too fast in visits that are too brief to really notice us, and filled with other 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 agendas. Um, in industrial healthcare, there for the possibility that care might happen and it ends up being a bit of an accident, something we end up celebrating and telling our friends um, when it's possible that on a routine basis, healthcare can be cruel uh, because of the rigid implementation of rules and, 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 uh, and the fear that people have of deviating from them. Uh, healthcare has to be careful in that it has to be based on science, based on evidence, has to be safe, but it also has to be kind, respecting the limited resources patients may have in terms of time, energy, and attention, making sure that it respects those resources so that patients can, people can use those resources to pursue their life's hopes and dreams. So it is to transform industrial healthcare to careful and kind care that we are working towards uh, a patient revolution. Excellent. Uh, so Victor and I actually started collaborating on the work that would come to be the patient revolution uh, around 2004, 2005, when uh, we started working together as colleagues at the, at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and it was there that our kind of collaboration and our sort of shared learning began to uh, emerge. And, and during that time, the, we spent a, a lot of effort and energy to work to develop tools um, that would help clinicians and patients come together and have uh, richer, more meaningful, more productive kind of dialogues. Um, but we also recognized that most of that work, our, our primary way of trying to affect um, change in healthcare was to convince clinicians and clinical systems to adopt our tools. And at some point as our learning kind of evolved and the challenges and issues that came to inform our understanding around industrial healthcare, uh, really kind of came to something that we could articulate. We also recognized that there was um, a whole, uh, op uh, there was a whole missing link that we weren't necessarily developing tools for patients and caregivers and communities and putting those tools in their hands and encouraging them to be kind of agents of change. And, and so that was really the kind of germ of the idea um, for the patient revolution uh, and as we began to kind of develop that. And so over the past couple of years, uh, since Patient Revolution kind of spun out as its own, um, its own nonprofit, we have worked to kind of model our approach. Um, and so how are we going to sort of try and begin to affect change kind of in this space? And it's come down to these kind of two primary areas. Um, and I think a large part of this for us has been because from the early days of when we started the patient revolution, one of the most kind of common responses that we hear to our mission is, yes, I'm on board, what can I do, how can I help, um, you know, what can we do to actually affect this change? And I think the reality is, is that we have really struggled to have a very good answer to those questions. Um, and in large part, that's because the healthcare environment that we operate in wasn't really built to accommodate pushes from change for the out, from the outside. Um, and it has really imagined patients as kind of passive participants, not necessarily active collaborators. Uh, and instead, it's really kind of endowed clinicians as the stewards of a caring philosophy um, who would kind of ensure that what was done was the, was the right thing. Um, but I think it's really occurred to us that the industrial turn has really pushed clinicians and the focus on care to the margins and is uh, ended up leaving clinicians as incapable or uh, as feeling like they can create change or affect kind of systemic change as, as patients kind of feel. Um, and so we really have tried to focus in on what will it take for us to begin to um, kind of model what this change might look like uh, in the world. And we've come down to kind of focusing on these two approaches. One is to really work in um, partnerships on particular projects where we're trying to advance careful and kind care at the system level. Uh, and the idea behind that is that we're essentially creating new pathways that others can follow. And this builds on our kind of past experience and expertise as um, kind of partners and makers and doers um, on a lot of our work around kind of shared decision-making tools and programs. Um, and that's where we've kind of focused a lot of that energy. And, and we have a number of different larger scale projects that are going on right now 
uh, that we are, are where we're working to begin to be able to do this. Um, we, I'm in Minnesota actually right now for a project we call um, Patient Voice, which is working with um, small rural healthcare uh, clinics, uh, especially around primary care um, in southeastern Minnesota, and are working with them to kind of collaboratively I, the, with the communities and the clinical staff to kind of rethink um, how we're organizing and the sort of systems that support primary care. Um, we're also building on our work around shared decision making um, to expand beyond just the tools that we usually design for patients and clinicians to use during the clinical and visit um, to kind of create spaces outside of the clinical visit that are for patients and their peers to begin to be able to come together around certain topics and create spaces uh, for people to think through uh, what may be important to them um, before they find themselves in a clinical encounter. And so we're currently developing those kind of programs for uh, mammography screening and also for cardiovascular risk. Um, so those are the areas where we're trying to kind of build on some of our past learnings. Um, and then the other piece that we're really trying to sort of dive into is more of a program level where we're trying to think about what sort of training and resources and support could we potentially offer to people that might help increase their confidence and their ability to begin to take action um, in their own lives or in their clinics or in their communities um, to advance careful and kind care um, and what that, what that might look like. And so what we're gonna do today is really talk to you about two areas that we're currently developing within that program space. Um, and areas where we've really kind of focused our energies. And what we're hoping to do today is share with you a little bit about where we are and um, ideally get your feedback because um, these uh, program, these parts, these components are in slightly different phases of development and they're really ripe for the type of um, uh, feedback that uh, can help us really make sure that we're designing them and creating them in a way that, that's going to be useful to people. Um, so the first is about really trying to focus in on building awareness through language and stories. Um, and I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to read uh, the kind of mission book that Victor wrote related to the patient revolution called Why We Revolt. Um, but one of its biggest uh, kind of um, contributions, I think, to this space is to introduce uh, a different type of language for talking both about what is wrong with healthcare and what the opportunities and possibilities in healthcare could be. And Victor alluded to this um, a little bit in his uh, kind of opening statements. And so uh, if you're still in a good spot, Victor, I might turn it over a little bit to you just to talk a bit about the language um, in Why We Revolt and, and what really kind of um, drew you to some of these uh, sort of terms and, and what impact you've seen in kind of talking about healthcare in this way. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Um, it's very important to use the right language because the language has a way of uh, shaping the way we think and, of course, shaping the way we act. If we talk about misaligned incentives, we may miss uh, the opportunity to identify that there is, in fact, extraction of value, uh, which is uh, driven by uh, greedy agents. Um, uh, and greed, for instance, is an, is, is an important word to use to identify the behavior of certain parts of healthcare that traps patients uh, between the seduction of the new drug or the robot that's going to operate on you or the proton beam facility that is going to destroy your cancer um, and the frustration of uh, the kind of messages that say, you know, less is more and uh, you have to make uh, wise, uh, wiser choices and uh, you may want to uh, try less intensive, less invasive, less aggressive, less costly therapy. Because in the first case, it is the greed of the makers of those solutions that is satisfied by the increased consumption. And in the second one is the greed of the payers that is satisfied by saving money. Um, similarly, um, the issue of cruelty uh, becomes an important uh, language to use to identify the situations in which people come to healthcare to be cared for and to, to experience um, uh, care directed at them and, but instead, they, they bump into rigidity, they bump into rules, they bump into um, uh, structures that perhaps at some point were designed with their best interest in mind, for instance, to protect uh, patient safety, 
uh, to protect privacy, but uh, the only thing that they accomplish when they are uh, implemented without judgment is um, to obfuscate the process of getting uh, care. Um, blur is an important word to describe how patients sometimes feel when they are not appreciated in high definition, when their situation is not noticed, when, they're, when they are not considered in their biology and in their biography. And as a result, when the response to their situation is not for, it's, it's, it's generic, it's for patients like them instead of being for this patient. Um, it's important to highlight the issue of burden. Uh, there are a lot of efforts in many healthcare organizations to reduce waste and to ap apply lean uh, approaches. But those, those reductions in waste tend to be limited uh, to uh, what happens inside the doors of the healthcare system and in, indeed end up transferring uh, work, uh, giving medical errands to patients and caregivers, which end up overwhelming them and, again, being disrespectful of their limited time, energy, and attention, which they rather dedicate to living their lives and pursuing uh, their uh, dreams. Um, or integrity, I don't think, it requires much uh, discussion. Uh, but solidarity becomes an important one. There is a political discussion at the moment about what is the best way to pay for health care. Um, and I think uh, the one has to pay close attention to the fact that we want uh, a health care system that is based in, on solidarity, not on the possibility of profit and value extraction, which tends to take money away from the front line of care. Um, I, I can see, I have seen the success of the book in other countries that have universal health care, and I'd be always wondering why would people be uh, interested in this book um, when they have universal health care. And it is because in those countries, the problem is that policies of austerity have taken resources from the front line, and the, and the end result in terms of the care of the patient is the same. Um, harried uh, consultations, uh, a pursuit of efficiency, of the so-called value, which at the end of the day ends up uh, uh, the inhibiting the possibility of care and the possibility of developing, particularly with patients that have chronic conditions, the conditions that go on that we cannot fix, the possibility of creating with them relationships to which we can fall back into if uh, there are adverse consequences, relationships that make us not uh, reliably deliver care in a reproducible way, that's not the goal, but actually help us be resilient so that we can bounce back from adversity relationships in which we can see each other, uh, perhaps offer some vulnerability, see each other for who we are, and develop um, and care for and about each other in ways that um, some patients and clinicians readily will describe as being uh, relationships of love. So that is the vision of uh, careful and kind care, and that is the, the, the role that language can play in focusing the mind and attention to the kind of healthcare system that we're looking for. Thank you, Victor. Um, and so one of the ways that we've tried to use this language is as um, a place of uh, reflection for both patients and clinicians, really any kind of member of the public, um, to think both about their own experiences uh, within healthcare and uh, about the opportunities and kind of places uh, where we could take healthcare um, and what it could be uh, as a um, kind of offering in our lives. And uh, to kind of support the language piece, we have tried to invest in ways to capture um, stories about healthcare um, that maybe are a little bit different from the types of stories that um, we usually kind of hear. So one of the things that we've been doing is um, a series of tweet chats, um, which are have been spearheaded by our uh, colleague and collaborator and board member, Carrie Sparling, um, who has really kind of led the effort to develop our once monthly tweet chats each month we've been um, taking on a different um, topic or issue from the book uh, and having an hour-long Twitter conversation about it. Um, so in December, we did love. Um, coming up in February, next Monday, we're doing one around conversations. We would absolutely love to have you all join us. And it's been a really powerful way, I think, to capture some of these small acts of kindness or some of the um, the uh, sort of um, ways in which cruelty can, or um, uh, blur or burden can kind of manifest in, in kind of people's lives, um, that in some ways a lot of what's happened with healthcare can feel like 
you know, it, it's happened in small increments and we've all kind of collectively become sort of used to it. So we think that there's real value in sort of turning our attention and our awareness um, with this new language filters to kind of think about those types of experiences. Uh, we've also developed um, some sets of cards that we use to kind of capture stories that are a little bit outside of the kind of normal sphere. And so we have um, these set of cards about patient, uh, patient barriers. And so what we often do is we share, we put the, this kind of set of cards in front of a patient and we ask them to think about um, a recent um, healthcare visit or one that stands out in their minds for them or, or kind of someone that they care for and to choose the cards that they think are relevant to that visit. Um, and usually people will choose one or two different um, cards and then we'll ask them to tell us the story and they will often share um, times when they um, were sharing something that was really important to them. We had one, um, uh, one woman who was, you know, sharing with her physician about how she was a vegetarian and how important it was um, for her to kind of be a vegetarian. And that was, it was really sort of dismissed by her um, physician and left her kind of feeling like uh, that maybe she was making wrong decisions or that it was something that really left her feeling like she, you, what was going on in her life like wasn't very important to her clinician. Um, and so we found this to be a really powerful way, again, for reflection to people to kind of think about their own visits uh, and then to, for us to begin to kind of categorize what some of these challenges are um, that people can find out there. And we, of course, started first with the patient barriers, the things that made it hard for patients to sometimes share something important with their clinician or share certain aspects about their lives. Um, and then we quickly realized that we kind of equally needed one for clinicians. Um, and what were some of the barriers that kept them from being able to uh, share about the things that are going on in their lives. Uh, and so we created a second set of barrier cards um, for clinicians. And uh, over the last couple of years, we've done a couple of events where we bring clinicians and patients together um, for different workshop activities. And oftentimes what we'll do is divide people into kind of different tables. And then we will put like one patient barrier and one clinician barrier at that table with mixed kind of groups of people. And we'll ask them to all kind of share stories. And it turns out to be a really uh, powerful kind of empathy building exercise. Um, for clinicians to kind of realize some of the unspoken things uh, that impact what their patients sort of share with them and then also for patients to sort of see what are some of the, the kind of issues and unspoken things that can impact um, how comfortable their clinicians are kind of sharing with them. Um, and in one of these workshops, the second half of the workshop then, we put uh, people in teams of clinicians and patients together and we ask them to use improv strategies to uh, build out a, a conversation to sort of move from how a conversation is today about a topic that they were interested in uh, and then to kind of build what a more kind of careful and, and kind um, conversation might look like. And people really drew a lot from some of the stories that were kind of shared during this barrier phase. Um, and one way that we, you know, we've been collecting a lot of these stories. And so uh, last year we started really wanting to be able to capture these in a way that we could share with other people um, and potentially begin to um, build a library out of. And so we started building a story library on our website. It's still very much a work in progress, but um, we're trying to kind of um, have a holding place um, for a lot of this information that we think is really critical. And so we've tried to kind of create illustrations um, and these are stories that people just submit through our website. Uh, the picture on the left hand side that you see there was a story that was shared with us um, and the person who shared it said when I was diagnosed with a chronic illness, the doctor didn't believe me when I said I was getting worse. He wouldn't refer me to a specialist. The doctor told me and my fiance that I must not be taking my medicines and that I was just overreacting after being diagnosed with lupus. Um, and in the story on the right hand side, uh, a person shared with us, I was just a year or two out of college and I was not getting anywhere and finding relief for ulcerative colitis. The GI doctor that I'd been going to gave me the same story every time. I never felt like I was being heard. He was not even open to trying anything different or any newly approved treatments. I ended up switching to our local teaching hospital when I was running out of mental and physical energy to keep fighting. They were able to get me into a last minute appointment. 
And during that appointment, we went through my disease and my medication history and all of the normal things. And then the doctor looked at me and told me, you deserve to live your life. And I cried. I had never had anyone, let alone a physician, recognize that I'd been so wrapped up in the daily task of managing symptoms and trying to manage life that I barely recognized it myself. It was the first time that a doctor had ever recognized that I was a whole person and not just a vessel of symptoms. Um, so again, just kind of an example of what we think, uh, you know, the kind of larger collection of these stories might help us begin to be able to understand about um, both industrial health care and also the opportunities for kind of careful and kind care. Oh, sorry. Um, so that's about some of the work that we're doing on our uh, around language and around stories. You can find uh, a lot of the tools, the clinician cards and the barrier cards uh, are available on our website. Um, and uh, the story library is there and, you know, continuing to kind of grow. And so, you know, we encourage anyone um, to, you know, if you have ideas or thoughts about how we might be able to even uh, build it or leverage that story library, we definitely kind of welcome those. Uh, the second uh, big program idea that we wanted to talk to you about today is one uh, that we've that's kind of a little bit newer um, and that we've really been working on, which is the idea of developing a school um, that would help kind of support action. And so a school for us, what does that mean? Well, for us, it means uh, the Patient Revolution School is a place where we can share knowledge and learning that's relevant to healthcare change. Um, it's a place where we want to engage kind of patients and clinicians and others, really everyone kind of as equal. We want it to be um, open to everyone. We want it to be a place where we can build community and relationships because we think that those things are, are really critical to kind of seeding the movement that we would like to see around careful and kind care. Um, we think that we, we want this to be a place that is supporting kind of sustained action, so over the long term, so recognizing that it will take time to, to build this future that we would like to have um, to see in the world. And that it also is a, creates a space for more community generated ideas. Um, so one thing that's really important to us is not to be um, going out into the world and saying, we want careful and kind care and we know exactly what that is or what that should be or what that looks like. I think, you know, as the sort of stories that I shared, I think we could all look at our own experiences or the experiences of others and be able to know, you know, some of the elements that we think are important in that space, but how to actually bring that to fruition um, and what are the ideas that we would create to support that systemically, um, we don't claim to have kind of, um, ownership over knowing what those ideas are. We think that they really needed to be developed um, at the community level. And so we're hoping that this can be a space for that as well. So the early kind of framework that we're developing for the school um, is that it would be a place where everyone takes classes together. Um, and so this would be patients and clinicians and students, both um, professional students in terms of medical students or nursing students or it, other staff or administrators who make a work in healthcare or community activists, um, really that it's, uh, that it's kind of an even playing ground. Um, and that uh, as part of that, we really want to reduce what are sometimes the common barriers to participation. So uh, we don't want it to cost a lot of money or be something that because of the cost, it keeps people from being able to part participate or because of qualifications um, that they kind of can't uh, participate. And we want to try and offer courses with a particular kind of patient revolution point of view. Um, and so the first two classes that we're actually beginning to develop for the school um, are kind of highlighted here. Uh, one, we're calling shared decision-making for everyone. So our team has kind of a long history uh, around shared decision-making and creating shared decision-making tools. And we, as part of the process of that, in addition to kind of creating a lot of tools, we've also developed, I think, an evolving and um, rich uh, philosophy about what shared decision-making means and um, 
it's very rooted in the idea of conversations um, and that uh, shared decision making is really a space for kind of conversational inquiry. And so what we're hoping to do in this class is bring clinicians and patients and everyone in between kind of together for an intro into our philosophy around shared decision making, um, what that can tell us about the current state of healthcare and also how we can use it to advance careful and kind care. So we're hoping to see this class as a way to foster rich discussion, um, expose people to some of our tools and resources, and to start to hopefully have people give us ideas about how patients and communities might be able to be um, avenues by which we are advocating and supporting and kind of getting more shared decision-making um, activities and tools into clinical and kind of community spaces. So. The idea behind these classes is that we invite people in and we hopefully the people who leave kind of feel empowered to start taking action um, in uh, their own spaces uh, around some of these ideas. The other class that we're currently kind of working to develop is uh, PFACs as agents of change. And so if you, if you don't know, PFACs are kind of the shorthand abbreviation for patient family advisory councils. Um, and PFACs have become increasingly common. Um, more and more hospitals and, and clinics have a, a patient family advisory council, but they oftentimes are not used um, as powerfully as they could be. They, they oftentimes are kind of um, seen as, as ways to rubber stamp the ideas that a, a clinic or a hospital is going to move forward with anyway. And so we were really excited about the idea of um, again, looking for pathways where patients can kind of have some power. We were like, well, these PFACs exist in the world um, and they already kind of have a foot in the door. And so what if we actually began to partner with them uh, and develop sort of strategies and training and tools um, so that uh, the people that serve on PFACs and the people that run them can actually, you know, we can use them potentially as a lever um, to address issues related to industrial health care and careful and kind care to kind of, you know, use that, that, um, that pressure to kind of force clinics and hospitals to potentially grapple with, with some of these ideas. Um, a corollary to the PFACs as agents of change idea um, that we've also been um, developing is uh, the idea of boards as an agent of change. And I think that that's another um, place, another class that we would like to kind of create, which is, um, you know, the, the places where uh, people outside of the clinical staff may have some um, uh, leverage, um, how can we get them excited about using some of that leverage and power to um, demand uh, answers and discussion um, about some of the issues related to industrial health care and the opportunities that could be there in kind of careful and kind care. Um, so these are very emergent uh, or early kind of ideas. We are working and putting our, our first class together um, and, and running it here in the, in the spring and to get some feedback and then, and then kind of hopefully um, build on, on uh, that and, and have more classes as we kind of go forward. So um, those are, uh, so those are kind of the big ideas that we were interested in talking to you about today and ideally kind of getting some feedback and some thoughts. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I'll pass it back to, uh, I guess, Sue. Um, if uh, we want to have a little bit of this kind of conversation. And any questions that you may have as well, Victor and I are both here um, to hopefully be able to answer those. Hi, uh, this is Sue Woods. Hopefully you can all hear me. Um, thank you so much, Victor and Maggie. Um, and uh, those of you who have been listening, um, if you have questions, uh, or answers to their questions. Um, <laughs> yes, great. Because we don't have uh, the ability uh, right today to be um, opening up the phone lines. Um, please put in, use the Q&A. Um, let me start off uh, with some questions that have come in, if that would be okay. Yeah, um, sure. So uh, you, you talk about some classes uh, and mm -hmm. courses. Um, um, and working with the PFACs. Um, there's a question of uh, uh, about to what degree and ideas you have specifically, and the courses fall into that, but around reinventing residencies and fellowships. 
And in terms of what degree uh, does that include patients in the co-design and co-creation of that? Yeah. I, I can I can take that. Yeah, perfect. Um, Great. So I, we've been working very, very preliminary, preliminarily with uh, educators in several medical schools across the country uh, that uh, have been com have come together around this idea of love and um, their their orientation has been that medical students increasingly are uh, taught of, of medicine as a as a situation where or as an as a career in which they have to give up uh, who they are, or they have to give up uh, what their context and situations are, which of course is uh, very um, parallel to what we ask uh, of patients when they have chronic conditions. And um, so uh, we're trying to, we're try I'm, I'm joining them in trying to see how medical education itself can be uh, uh, focused more on uh, personal realization through care and through love, uh, love to oneself and love to others. Um, there is a, um, a discussion in that group about the role that that uh, that uh, pe other people, non-professionals, have. Uh, it could be patients, could be caregivers, or citizens could have in not only co-creating the curriculum but also uh, learning together. And uh, we're going to be paying attention to that space because, as Maggie mentioned, the vision for this for the school that we want to start is that. Um, the uh, students uh, will not be uh, siloed by who they are or what role they play, but they're going to be brought in together. Yeah, and I, I think the, the point on the, you know, idea of patients and the kind of uh, co-creation and production of the curriculum, I think that you know, we, we're sort of seeding the school with some of these early, um, early uh, classes um, that we feel like we have uh, developed enough kind of understanding around to kind of build out some of this curriculum. Um, but the whole idea behind the school is to kind of really invite a, a cross section of everyone connected to healthcare kind of into this space. And then we want more, we want this to be a little bit open platform in the sense that um, other topics uh, that might be relevant or interesting or identified by the participants in the school and that many of them may, they may also be the right people to um, partner together and help figure out how to teach a patient revolution version of that particular um, course or class. And so, um, you know, we we want to kind of respect and encourage kind of the everyone to kind of be part of, of what it is that we're sort of trying to create. So that's certainly um, a critical part of what we're doing. We also want to recognize we don't want to only use patients as um, or, or kind of members of the public as kind of a, a tool to um, help. Uh, you know, make clinicians better. Like we also think that there's huge opportunity in exposing um, patients and caregivers and community activists and other community members to some of the ideas that we've learned around working in this healthcare space and that they might see huge opportunity to sort of take some of those and run with them in really interesting ways in the spheres where they um, operate. And so the kind of combination of that is, is really important to us. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question about the patient and family advisory councils often become a box checking exer uh, exercise. Um, yeah. How do you how do you sort of uh, avoid that uh, <laughs> avoid that highway? Um, and I would add, I would add from a medical education standpoint. Um, you know, it t it's sort of seen as the touchy feely sort of uh, default that people, um, uh, you know, don't see it as important or critical as the diagnosis and treat, see one, do one, teach one uh, pathway. So how do you, right. how do you avoid those, those um, sort of defaults that really, <laughs> really need to come out of the, come out of the, come out into the sunshine? Right. Well, I think the, the sort of first thing that we're trying to do is acknowledge that there's a lot of truth in those, um, those framings, right? And to 
uh, and to begin by calling them out and uh, and saying that this this in and of itself is is potentially somewhat problematic, and to um, you know not hide what we're um, uh, fundamentally what we're trying to do. Um, so I think that. Uh, especially like with the PFACs, the idea that PFACs are often um, rubber stamped or, or box checking, so we can say, "Hey, we took this to some patients, and they um, and they were fine with it." Um, that that is the reality of how these were used. And so, in thinking about the sort of tools and resources and support that we might offer to people who say serve on a PFAC, is to acknowledge that we're asking them to potentially take on a more revolutionary um, role, right? And to be a bit more of a rabble rouser um, and to create more, uh, to agitate for um, uh, more sort of change and discussion in the spaces where they potentially um, do have some power and to think about what does it take or what can we offer the support for people who may choose to take on that role, right? Who may be willing to kind of be more of that rabble rouser. Um, and I, I you know, we don't have the answer to how to make, um, you know, uh, clinics and, and hospitals necessarily respond to what we're doing, but um, what we're trying to kind of uh, do within the patient revolution is recognize that we really do believe that it will ultimately be patients and caregivers and the public who um, can agitate for the type of change towards careful and kind care that we think should happen. But the reality is, is that they often um, are operating as individuals or small groups of people um, against groups that have a lot of power. And so what can we potentially be able to offer them as the patient revolution that is, is something that sort of says we have your back and this sort of um, uh, collective community that we kind of bring to this. And I think we, from our background, we see opportunities to do that both in terms of tools and resources and support that we may be able to create, um, and then also the community that we're able to build um, that can help, uh, you know, help support people as they take those um, steps, the early people who are willing to kind of put themselves out there um, and try something a little bit new kind of um, early on, or if you're a clinician within your institution um, who starts to uh, push back a little bit as you're saying, Sue, about the do what, you know, the, the focus on diagnostics. Um, I think the other um, kind of corollary to this and that we're really lucky is uh, in addition to being the co-founder of Patient Revolution, Victor also runs um, a, a research group at the Mayo Clinic, um, the Knowledge and Evaluation Research Unit, sometimes called the CARE Unit. And this is a group of um, uh, clinicians and uh, clinical researchers and um, health policy researchers and, and research fellow, like um, a whole, you know, designers, a whole sort of rich group of people um, who are doing a lot of the kind of academic work in this space to try and advance a lot of these ideas that I think creates a, a, a powerful kind of collaboration for the very front lines, hands on, you know, um, uh, out there in front kind of work that the patient revolution is trying to do. And I don't know, Victor, if you want to speak a little bit to the kind of corollary with the care unit. He might have had to drop off, so um, he might be in the dead zone between here and the airport. So. Um, but that's that's another kind of um, collaborator that we have that I think hopefully allows us to try and speak to at the with the kind of plain language to the public, but also academic language um, to advance some of these ideas as well. Um, speaking of the front line, have have you uh, had any success or plans to work with? frontline staff and administrative staff who are often the first people to interact with patients and families and uh, can be a source of uh, quite a lot of stress. Absolutely. So a lot of our project work um, that we do is especially um, about kind of engaging uh, a lot of the frontline staff and also kind of patients and kind of communities around these collaborative co-creation type of efforts. And so, as I mentioned, these two small communities in southeastern Minnesota that we're currently working with, um, we there we are working with the sort of uh, physicians and um, clinicians and uh, nurses and um, the call center staff and the schedulers and the um, 
uh, emergency department, you know, so kind of everyone in the whole kind of ecosystem um, we're really kind of bringing together to sort of think about how do we experiment uh, and try um, some new approaches that would help us then make recommendations back to the institution about how the systems that are supporting staff could make it easier for um, the staff in particular to be allow care to be more flexible and adaptable to the situations that patients find themselves in. So uh, we see that as really uh, ultimately critical um, to being able to imagine how some of this change might happen, you know, practically in the real world. So um, <clears throat> we have a lot, we have several other questions and comments. I just want to make sure we get, we get through uh, uh, most or all of them. So, uh, one provider's commenting about <clears throat> clearly we have an unprecedented level of burnout and stress in clinical care with obviously lots of quality and measurement and electronic records how do how how do we present this in a way that um you know is there a win win here is there an opportunity to 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 drive um, caring, uh, better caring care at the same time we're addressing those issues and maybe even reducing them to some degree. Yeah, I, th I think, and if I think if Victor were here, he would also kind of reiterate that we think that the, um, a lot of the issues of burnout are directly, seem to be directly related to the um, sort of system, system pressures that are pulling clinicians further and further away from being able to kind of take on that fundamental role of caring for the person who's in front of them. Um, and so I, I think what we've sort of seen is the shift in, in clinicians from, it, it might have been that, you know, a decade or two ago when most clinicians worked in small practices and they had, they were in charge of kind of how their systems were gonna operate. Um, and they were able to kind of prioritize potentially what an appropriate amount of trade-offs um, around that kind of caring relationship might be, um, that the move towards industrial healthcare has really left them um, feeling not very empowered to kind of advocate for some of the, those trade-offs that they think would be important. And so I think, you know, one of the things that we're, we're hoping to kind of um, do within the school and with some of the other programs that we have is to engage um, clinicians and kind of coming together and seeing what the kind of power and numbers for advocating for uh, some of these uh, new ways of trying to push back on some of those systemic pressures, um, you know, might be. I think that we well, I don't think that they're sort of mutually exclusive. I think that we also want to be careful of not necessarily saying that we can have our cake and eat it too, you know? So it may be that um, I don't think that we need to make every visit an hour long, you know, for there to be enough time um, for uh, patients and clinicians to be able to come together and deal with the situations that they may find themselves in. But um, it may be that we need to kind of move away from a model that says every conversation has to happen in, in 10, 10 or 15 minutes, right? And so I don't know exactly what that, that sort of balance is, but I think clinicians and patients are the ones who um, potentially can kind of figure out how to have productive conversations. Um, but one of the first things that they need is to not necessarily feel like they're being timed and on the clock uh, and that instead we sort of create those spaces and we see what happens when people are able to come together and then potentially we work to build our systems to support the patterns that we see in those productive conversations rather than the sort of pure efficiency model which says we need to see this many pay, you know which which uses time as, as the kind of key metric that we follow so um i think we're trying to kind of advocate for uh um Way that we want to create space for people to start to kind of think about reorienting care around some of the ideas that we have in careful and kind care. Um, and we're really looking for partners and collaborators who are interested in trying to um, kind of ideate uh, and experiment and prototype around those things. Yep. So uh, speaking of uh, patients and clinicians and uh, other health professionals, uh, Let's talk about the society. Um, society of Participatory Medicine right. is, is incredibly unique uh, 
and uh, I can't think, and uh, our members are uh, all in <laughs> for, what, for what you're talking about. Um, how, uh, how might uh, this organization of hundreds, uh, national and some international folks, uh, position itself, partner with you to help drive uh, this vision and goals? Um, or what specifically could our members do? Uh, so let's just let's just uh, I'll just stop there. Um, I think that there are probably. Um, were you asking me, Sue? Well, <laughs> if I could open the phone and everybody society. talk, I'm sure I we would have, we would have a robust yeah. conversation. But um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, I and we've you yeah. know. Great. You and I and Jan and, and and others have talked, but you know we have uh, sort of like-minded uh, organizations, and we're all you know sort of like we're all small, alone. Yeah. But how do we how do we um, create? How do we work together? Right, right, right. So if you click forward just to the next the next page, it'll just have our contact information, and so I oh. want to make sure that. Um, sorry, yeah, I forgot to. I, well, I I stayed here on this discussion page, so. Um, this is our contact information, patientrevolution.org is our website. It's definitely a work in progress, um, and we're a small team right now, as, as Sue kind of mentioned, so, you know, it can take us a little bit to kind of get everything up there, but you'll find a lot of our tools, the things that I mentioned today there on that website, they are free to kind of download and use. Um, if you see an opportunity in a your workplace or in other groups that you're working with to, to maybe adapt or use some of the tools, we really encourage that. We would love to hear how you're using it and, and, um, and what ideas it makes you think of and maybe there's opportunities then for us to collaborate on the next iteration of tools or a different type of tool. Um, and our door is always open for those, those types of conversations. So please feel free to reach out to myself um, or to Victor around that. Um, or uh, uh, kind of on our on our Twitter, or kind of online. Um, I think that there's also an opportunity as we get the kind of school up and running. We I think some of our early um, uh, early versions will be kind of small, little bit curated classes, so that we can get kind of feedback. So if you have clinicians or patients, if you are interested in maybe being an early guinea pig for some of our classes, um, please reach out to me. Because uh, um, we would love, you know, we're definitely looking for, for people to kind of join. Um, I think many of you may also uh, be, you know, active in other um, spheres. And so if you see um, an opportunity for collaborations or for sort of other types of projects, I encourage you to kind of reach out. Um, you know, we definitely would be kind of open to that as well. Um, and, you know, I think. Our hope is to really uh, advance a number of these kind of programs this year. And uh, if you have ideas about how we could kind of take the mission, you know, our, our doors open. We're really looking for people who um, who want to run with some of this because uh, we think that's that's what can really kind of take it and move it into places um, that we haven't yet reached yet. Great. So, um, and I think we'll be able to send the slides uh, to folks who registered, uh, certainly who attended. Um, Great. One point, yeah, and the schools, people are, uh, there's lots of comments uh, on the okay. discussion. Um, I'll make sure, I can't get through them all here. I want to ask, wonderful. Uh, the schools and the education is wonderful, co-creation is really needed figuring out ways to integrate and mainstream these kind of educations and skills. Um, but one thing um, that that comes up uh, a lot in is the whole concept of patient satisfaction. We know it's not well designed today, but it does, you know, it's sort of like great, you know, questions are asked. They're not necessarily the right questions. They're not yeah. focused. On, on me as a patient and a family, they're focused on you. <laughs> um, yeah. But they are. But there is money attached, and we all know in healthcare, money talks. Um, have you? Has your group uh, talked about or thought about ways to to kind of move the needle on that? Um, and is there uh, any inter yeah. intersection between redesigning um, that whole sort of patient? Uh, opinion 
uh, channel to, to kind of drive it towards this. Yeah. I think we have had a number of ongoing kind of conversations um, within that space, both from the kind of very rabble rousey of really wanting to invest in thinking about how we might measure things like love and cruelty, um, to also, you know, having conversations uh, with people about some of the, you know, the way that the um, existing kind of patient satisfaction scores are kind of um, captured and what we might be able to kind of do that, you know, might be a little bit less, you know, blow everything up and more, you know, kind of um, small. I think, uh, you know, there's, um, I think that there, we haven't, we don't have a project around that yet uh, right now. Um, and so I think there's opportunities for that. We've had a lot of conversations about it, but we haven't necessarily turned it into a project yet. Um, and so I think for us, the thing that's really important is you know, we want to enter into any kind of partnership or project able to kind of speak with the voice of the patient revolution. Um, and so I think we're particularly interested in finding places where um, the kind of powers that be may be interested in kind of thinking beyond how they how they kind of normally capture a lot of those metrics right now. Um, and so, yeah, so they, they're, we've talked about them, but again, small team, we haven't necessarily taken that on as a project yet, but if you know people or think there'd be interest, you know, please reach out. I also just wanted to answer because I saw a number of people kind of um, mentioned on the, on the questions around the school. So um, I think the school will mostly be um, kind of online. Uh, so we want to make it again available to as many people as possible. And so uh, we're hoping that there will be components of the school, especially as it grows, that will it will have some kind of um, real world or, or geographic, you know, kind of touch points at, at different times where we can bring people together. But um, it will be something that's kind of online. We are working to kind of come up with some creative ways that. Um, uh, we that people interact with each other um, during the uh, a course um, so that it's not just uh, you know a one on one kind of thing, but we are doing some of that community building. So again, um, all of it's a work in progress. But yeah, uh, we you you wherever you are geographically, you theoretically could join us. You could be part of the school. Okay, we're coming down to to the watch to the top of the hour. Um, going through. Uh, the questions. One is interesting. Question is, what is the role of the narr of narrative medicine playing in advancing the revolution? Yeah. So we've been in contact with, and, and I li I live in New York City, so I've actually um, had some collaborations and ongoing conversations with the um, team up at the narrative medicine program at Columbia, and actually that workshop that I was telling you about, where. Um, in the second half, clinicians and patients came together and uh, and used. Uh, in improvisation to sort of um, go through iterations and develop a, a new conversation that a clinician patient would have was actually a collaboration with um, the, the narrative medicine program. So I think there is a huge amount of opportunity there um, and that we um, sort of speak uh, in a lot of the sort of same language. I think a lot of the narrative medicine program is, um, you know, towards clinicians and kind of around clinicians. And so I think, uh, you know, collectively we're able to um, kind of create a space where those clinicians and patients are kind of coming together and um, thinking about how they can kind of collaboratively, um, you know, develop new ideas and new ways of talking to each other. Okay, what, one last question here before we close out. Um, as healthcare is moving to paying for value, um, where do you see some very specific areas of, of intersection? Um, is that something that you've been sort of thinking about? Um, Around the value piece? Uh, yeah, kind of high value? Because there's, you know, again, it's sort of like the question about follow the money um, yeah. and trying, you know, trying to fit in what, you know, how we want to modulate it in a in a place where there's traction so yeah. um yeah so there, yeah so there is this i wouldn't i would you know it's moving i wouldn't call it a revolution but there are places that are moving towards paying for value rather than volume so where, where do you uh are you working on i trying to identify the opportunities there 
Yeah, I think it's it's a little bit di less direct than that, but I think we are certainly kind of within those spaces. And I think that for us, one of the key things that we want to do is make sure that value doesn't get defined as only what is valuable to a, a clinical organization um, or only uh, 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 based on um, outcomes that, you know, don't really necessarily take into consideration the sort of patient situation. And so I think, you know, the idea of paying for value is, you know, not necessarily problematic in and of itself, but it can become problematic when the definition of value has only been set by a small group of people. So I think for us right now, we're very interested in any kind of project and collaboration that would allow us to kind of come to the table and speak to that issue. Um, and then to work collaboratively to think about what that might look like going forward. Um, so I think that we aren't necessarily trying to kind of fit in with what some of the accepted ideas about what value might be right now. We see ourselves as a little bit more of the rabble rouser, but we're, we're trying to do it um, in a way that still maybe gets us invited to the table to see if we can use that as an opportunity to agitate for um, a more sophisticated and more, you know, complex, but ultimately realistic way of thinking um, about some of these issues. Great. Thank you so much, Maggie. And thank you, uh, Victor. You can, I know he probably got stuck uh, in a bad <laughs> zone. To run by now. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Sarah Krug and Jan Oldenburg. And um, you don't know that Ben Fleury did all the work uh, on the back end. Thank you to Ben. Uh, please, uh, uh, if you aren't familiar with the Society for Partic Participatory Medicine, Please uh, learn about us, go online, uh, uh, S4PM is our Twitter handle, uh, and uh, any of us can uh, talk to you uh, by phone. We have people across the country. We can meet you in person, too. Um, thank you, and we look forward to, uh, for you to join us on our next learning exchange. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank this was wonderful.